Questions before we get started? <clears throat> Everybody did their homework last night? New version of Mark on the website if you want to copy down a new one. I did my homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about occupancy today. How many of you actually worked with or done some occupancy work? A few. How many of you have never heard of it? Heard of it, just don't know what it is. All right, well, we'll spend a little time introducing it. It's something, actually, it's not all that new. It's been out there about 20 some years now, more than that. These slides, oh, by the way, the slides start on page 67. <clears throat> yeah, um, Daryl McKenzie first wrote this up, wrote up the simple occupancy model. It, actually, it had been around for quite a while before then, but he really formalized it and put it out in the literature. And uh, there had been some other parameterizations of it put out before. Uh, but he's the one that really promoted it. So this is Daryl McKenzie, this guy right here. Oops, I got to get my cursor. You can't see my cursor, laser pointer. This guy right here is Daryl McKenzie. Uh, Larissa Bailey has been done a lot of work with it. Uh, Andy Royal, there's Jim Nichols, not in jail this time. Um, Jim Hines, this guy right there. Steve, is that you next to him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that and think, yeah, I recognize the other guy. <laughs> and down here is Ken Polly. <laughs> anyway, these were the authors of the book that came out. Oh, boy, when did that come out? Late 1999 or something like that. Anyway. And so, uh, <clears throat> oops, did I go too many? No. Nope. So the idea behind occupancy is we're going to go out, the simplest case, we have all kinds of twists on this, but uh, the simplest case is you go out and you've got sites that you're going to sample. So let's just suppose we want to search for prairie dogs in Colorado and we're going to set up one kilometer squares. Uh, the reason why we use one kilometer squares is because uh, we don't want to work on the uh, land search. You want to not have to have one mile squares because then you tend to match up that way. So using one kilometer blocks, we can kind of get away from that, uh, not, not have such a, a sample bias because of that, because of the survey system. And we go out and we survey for prey dogs. And you might think that's pretty easy, but white-tailed prey dogs in particular are fairly hard, well, not hard to spot, but they, they can, they're not like regular black-tailed prey dogs where they're setting up looking at you all the time. They're a little easier to <clears throat> a little harder, white tails are a little harder to find. So you, you send people out and they search these and they may or may not see prey dogs. They may find old mounds but there's no prey dogs and they may not even notice that there are some new mounds and there are prey dogs. So you've got this detection problem. One of the assumptions is, is that we do not have false detections. Uh, there are models that allow false detections now but those just create a really big mess because uh, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that for the moment. The, the mistakes, the errors in your data, not really errors, are the fact that you surveyed and there were prairie dogs there and you missed them. <clears throat> so presence absence, that's what we're doing here. Lots of examples of this. Here's, we did a workshop in Ohio, so all these slides are sort of geared towards Ohio, but black bear occupancy across Ohio with camera traps. You put up a camera trap on, a, on your one kilometer blocks, or maybe you use a little bigger block then. And so what proportion of, the, of those squares are used, those grids? <clears throat> um, oh, how fast is some invasive plant spreading in purple loosestrife? Um, Woodlot birds, 
Now this gets to be more interesting because you start thinking about, well, what, how do you define your sampling unit as a woodlot? And they may be different sizes and so forth. Or another example, surveying amphibians and ponds. Your sampling, your samples, the population that you're sampling is all ponds. And so you've got to have a list of ponds, you've got to build a randomly select ponds and go to them and survey sites if you're going to do a, a big wide area survey. So those woodlots are an example of that where you, you'd have to basically map out all the woodlots in the area that you want to be surveying and then pick a random sample of those and go survey them. Um, CRP land and quail. Yeah, anyway, there's lots of examples. Oh, disease modeling is another. What proportion <clears throat> of crows have been exposed to West Nile virus? So you get a random sample of crows uh, somehow, and you, uh, you survey crows to find out if they've got the titer for West Nile virus. <clears throat> Rattlesnakes, uh, smallmouth bass, <laughs> interacting species, uh, oh, community patterns, species richness of migratory birds, greater in oak hickory or pine forest. Lots of examples where this stuff has been used. Field methods usually visits or access a site at least once, but more often if you want to do a good occupancy survey. You can't, get, you can't estimate detection if you only survey a site once, each site once. You've got to survey a, most of your sites you've got to survey multiple times in order to have estimate detection probabilities. Just like in the capture recapture business, um, you've got to You've got to have a couple chances to see the animal before you actually can say, well, some probability is not there because you've got your one ones, you've got your one zeros, you've got your zero ones, you've got your zero zeros. And, and what fraction of those zero zeros are actually detected and you just missed them on both cases. So the only way you can pull that apart is to have a couple of samples, multiple visits. <clears throat> now, what this field method slide here is shown is the way people used to approach this problem. They tried to get around it by only visiting once, but standardizing and basically saying they had pretty good, pretty high probability of detection. Well, we know better than that now. Your probability of detection isn't nearly as high as you would think. Um, it can be, but anyway, non-detection of site does not imply species is absent. That's the big thing. Detection probabilities are less than one. All these slides are just getting at that point. So we estimate detection probabilities with these multiple visits. <clears throat> now, again, we have to assume closure. If we don't assume closure, then what we're estimating is not the probability of occupancy, but we're estimating the probability of the site being visited once in a while. <coughs> a little different. During that period that we do our two visits, we assume that there's no colonization or extinction. That site is always occupied or never occupied during multiple visits. That's the key point, if you want to estimate true occupancy. Otherwise, we get this sort of weird uh, variable. It's not the probability of occupancy. It's the probability that there may have been one when I got there, which isn't probably what you want. Multiple visits through time. Uh, again, this slide is just to make the point that you want to design your surveys in such a way that you have closure. You don't want to be doing songbirds during spring migration because obviously it's not closed. <laughs> Multiple visits in space has been a big issue. Uh, some people have argued that, well, no, I can just, I can have multiple, <clears throat> I can visit the same space um, let's see, how does this go again? You, uh, you survey a big plot and you go to different parts of it and you treat those as your, your samples. So you go over and you visit one corner of the plot one day, well, no, on the same day, then you go visit another corner of the plot and you claim that that's replicate sampling. Um, this problem of sampling spatially like that gets you in trouble in general. And my advice is try to avoid that if you can do it. Um, but there are several papers in the literature, and I can tell you more about it if you're involved in one of those kinds of studies that uh, address the issue. But you basically have to sample with replacement 
which means that you sample the same spaces multiple times, <laughs> which seems sort of crazy. But anyway, sampling with replacement and without replacement, uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Sampling with replacement means that you reach into the bucket and you pull out a sampling unit and you check it. And with replacement, you put it back in and stir the bucket back up and you could grab it again. Without replacement, you take it out. And so then you can't sample it again. Well, with spatial sampling, when you're using space as your replicate, you have to sample with replacement, as it turns out. That's, that's a cul-de-sac that we really don't want to get into this early in the talk. <laughs> um, okay, so assumptions. Sites are occupied by species of interest for the duration of the survey period. Use appropriate methods to detect. Not falsely detected. That's the big one. You can't have false detections. <clears throat> um, you get back a vector of zeros and ones. Okay, detection of species of site is assumed to be independent of detecting species of other sites and also assumed to be independent on your site. In other words, uh, you can't have two observers out there walking around and they're both working together. Uh, so to speak. In other words, if one of them sees the bird, sees a species of interest, the other person then writes it down, yeah, they saw it too because observer A told them there it was. <clears throat> Obviously that's lack of independence. Um, you can have two observers working the site at the same time, but they've got to do it independently. So maybe they, you know, just circulate independently on the site. And that's, that's legitimate. Another trick for doing that is to use removal sampling, which we can get into later on where you have two observers and they're working dependently, but you've got observer A, everything that that observer spots uh, keeps to himself or maybe points him out to observer B, but observer B is also looking and sees some additional <coughs> critters. So it's like it's a second uh, sample in a removal survey. Observer A made the first pass and took everything out. Observer B comes along and finds some additional ones removal type of a survey. So that's another option that's been done on this stuff. There are parallels to closed capture, what we just did Tuesday afternoon. And basically what it amounts to is that in closed captures, you're going to estimate the number of sites that are not occupied. That's your F zeros, interestingly enough. And in fact, you can run these simple models of occupancy through the closed capture estimators and get the same answer. Just a little bit trickier to understand exactly what you're getting, but you're estimating the number of sites that are occupied. So you know you've surveyed 100 sites, you run the data through capture recapture and it comes back and says, well, I estimate that there's 85 plots occupied. So you got an 85% occupancy rate because you know you surveyed 100. <clears throat> so that's the Closed capture estimators, uh, at one point, were used for this kind of stuff by different people. Uh, okay, model assumptions, these are the key ones. Closure, sites, surveys are independent, sites are independent, no one to model heterogeneity. What do we mean by that? That's the same old thing that, that your P is constant, that every site has exactly the same probability of P, or else we have coverage to model it. <coughs> It's the idea that you've got this parameter homogeneity, okay? Obviously with occupancy data, that's going to be a biggie that we're going to spend some time talking about how to avoid or how to get around. <clears throat> the model parameters, finally get down to the good stuff here. Psi, it's the probability of site I is occupied. Now we had size yesterday, it were transitions. <laughs> uh, P is still the same kind of detection probability we're talking about, except it's, it's uh, a little different. Anyway, this psi is, is the probability of sites occupied. So I got to tell you a funny story about psi. Uh, we had a, when I was on the Mexican spot owl recovery team, we had a big report. We sent it out for review. One of the reviewers came back and says, I don't understand what these pitchforks are all about, but. <laughs> So every time I see a sigh, I think of a pitchfork. 
Uh, you can think of them as pitchforks too. They look like pitchforks when you've got the right font. <laughs> Devil's pitchfork sometimes. All right, so you got this probability of occupancy, and then you got P, the probability of detecting the species. Now, no marks here. We're not marking animals. We're not, we're, all we're doing is just going out and surveying a site, and we're saying, did we detect the species? So you can immediately see that, that a site that's occupied by, say, 100 individuals is going to be much more likely to have a high detection probability than one with, say, one individual, as an example. So um, we've got this innate heterogeneity that we're going to have to account for. Uh, but anyway, for the moment, we're just going to assume that everything's kosher. And we're going to work through the model, and then we'll start talking about how we elaborate on it. <clears throat> so we got a detec detection history. We go out and we visit the site for four times. And that gives us this history, 1001. So now the probability that site's occupied is psi. Obviously, it is occupied because we saw the species there. So then we have a P1, 1 minus P2, 1 minus P3, P4. That's the information we're going to use to estimate P. Uh, just to kind of keep it back of your head, the only information to estimate P comes from sites that are occupied. <coughs> you can't estimate detection probabilities if a site's not occupied, right? It's only those zeros and ones within histories that allow you to estimate detection probabilities, just like the closed captures. <coughs> Another way to think about it, if you ran the data through a closed capture model, like we've been doing, you'd only include histories that had ones in them. All the zeros you'd have to throw away. All the histories that had all zeros you'd throw out. Because there's no information about P in those histories. So you've got to have some detections in order to estimate detection probability. And you, well, you don't have to have misses, I guess. Uh, how about a history of all zeros? This is the first time you've seen a history of all zeros. Mark, normally when you run in a, in a counter history and it's all zeros, it says, uh, you screwed up. What's wrong? Occupancy data, nope, that's a valid history. And so there it is. What's the probability of having a history of all zeros? Well, it could be occupied with probability psi. And it would just be that product of the four 1 minus p's, right? But you could be not occupied. So it could have a probability of 1 minus psi, if that's what explains it. That might look a little bit like mixture models yesterday. And in fact, it is. One of the things about occupancy models is they are mixture models. <clears throat> You've got a mixture of occupied sites and unoccupied sites. Um, so the same trick. How do we generate the estimates? Well, we can compute those cell probabilities. We put them into a likelihood. And we take the, that likelihood across to all the sites. <clears throat> um, we get the variance covariance matrix from Fisher's information matrix. And at this point, the little comment at the bottom says, however, parameters cannot be site specific without additional information covariates. And that's right. We've got to have covariates involved. But again, we know all about covariates at this point, right? Bring in the logit function as an example. That's what we use there at the bottom on P, but we can also have logit functions that predict psi for each site. So uh, one of the examples you're going to get to work on this morning is on swift foxes in eastern Colorado. And the proportion of short grass prairie on a, on a site, on the sampling unit that we're going to survey, it was a really good predictor of whether swift foxes occur, as you might expect. Uh, so we model that as a proportion. We just say that psi is a load of beta naught plus beta 1 times percent short grass prairie. Um, <clears throat> so you can have site-specific covariates, and maybe that affects your detection probabilities too. So that maybe the, the site characteristics affect P as well as psi. Um, you can have only variables that affect P, like maybe the weather conditions at that point in time that you surveyed it. Observer is another good one to keep in mind. Different observers have different acuity. 
if Steve and I were doing a bird survey, you'd have a big observer effect. Right? In fact, most of you, if you were working against Steve on birds, you'd have a big observer effect. <laughs> so um, observers, a lot of times, one of the tricks in designing these things is you don't send the same observer to the same site every time. You, you swap them around. You try to randomize, maybe not randomize, but systematically make sure that each observer goes to each site if you've got different observers or, or that you've got them paired up in some way. So anyhow. Missing observations, this happens a lot in these data, and this is where the dot notation Mark originally came from, was that what happens when we, uh, we go out and we try to survey a site three times and we don't make it? Or maybe, maybe we're only trying to do two surveys, like we're going to talk about later on, and we miss some. Well, that's okay, we can put a dot in there. We can still get the information, you're estimating P across all sites, and you just put in a dot. So. Let's suppose that at unit one, sampling unit one, we went out and we got there, except on day four we didn't make it. Unit two, we missed out on days one and three. So the history for unit one would be psi times P1, one minus P2, P3, no P4, one minus P5. Just leave out the P4 part. Or alternatively, you can think of it as P4 was zero. So one minus zero is one. You just multiply the thing by one. Likewise, down below, you can think of P1 as zero and P3 as zero. And so one minus zero is one, and you, you multiply by one. OK? Nice and simple. Now, heterogeneity. I've alluded to it several times. And sort of dodged around it. Journey assume that detection and occupancy probabilities are constant across sites. Or they're a function of measurable covariates. Now, even when they're a function of measurable covariates, we don't know, covariates don't explain all the heterogeneity because covariates are never perfect and we don't understand all the things that we need to have in there. Uh, so we're, we've got a couple of different ways that we go at it to try to handle this individual or this heterogeneity, site heterogeneity or detection heterogeneity. Um, what happens when we have this unmodeled heterogeneity is that parameter estimates can still be valid in certain places. Like, for example, um, in occupancy, uh, if you've got a lot of heterogeneity across your sites, your average psi, in other words, what you would project for the entire area that you drew, this, drew your sampling units from, would be about right. But it'd probably have a too small of a variance for a start. And then in detection probabilities, you could underestimate detection. Um, if you've got a lot of heterogeneity in detection probabilities, you're going to probably underestimate uh, occupancy. Why? For the same reason that in small and uh, closed capture surveys, when you have a lot of heterogeneity in your individual animals, you tend to only catch the ones that are easy to catch, right? easy to see in this case. So therefore, you're going to overestimate P and you're going to probably underestimate occupancy for the same reason. Same kind of mentality you get in closed capture models. Uh, we have these various tricks here, and I left one off. Ah, my favorite random effects is not in there, but I actually have a random effects model for occupancy too. OK, covariates. We got site specific, we got survey specific, we got observer specific, we got, we can, every covariate you can think of, you can probably work in there one way or the other to try to explain heterogeneity. And in the case of site characteristics, to explain heterogeneity in psi, that's a very meaningful analysis. Like I said about the swift foxes, the probability of occupancy of swift foxes is a function of short grass prairie. And so you'd be crazy not to include it. <clears throat> um, the other way we can do these heterogeneity, the mixture models, only for P, can't do that for psi. And so uh, you can have a, well, we already talked about Shirley Pledger's model <coughs> yesterday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. But there's the same, same kind of a formula we saw 
last Tuesday afternoon for the mixture models. You got a psi out in front again, but then you got your pi, probability that was in mixture A, and then one minus pi A is the probability it's in mixture B, and again, in occupancy models, you can have more than two mixtures if you need them, but I seriously doubt you're ever gonna have that problem. Uh, same thing with mixture models as before. You can't tell which mixture each site belongs to, but you can estimate those parameters. So you got these probabilities. <clears throat> and I should have another slide in here about my logit normal random effects model, because that's also now on mark, uh, where you attack on a random normal error on a logit scale to P, just like we did for the Huggins analysis on Wednesday, Tuesday, okay? That's also out there. However, there's a pretty neat trick that the Royal Nichols paper talks about or that came up with, and that's the idea that, that you know that a site that has lots of individuals is gonna have a higher detection probability than a site that's, say, only got one individual of the species that we're interested in, right? I mean, that just, that ought to make intuitive sense right off the top. So what they said was, Royal Nichols 2003, that if you assume that R is probability detection of an individual, now, gotta keep this straight. P is a detection, probability detection of the species on the site. R is a probability detection of an individual, given that it's out there. So suppose that you have, you know that there are cap N individuals on that site. Well, then the probability of not detecting any of them is one minus R to the N, and the probability of detecting one or more of them is one minus that. Looks like P star, which is what you've already seen. And so therefore, the probability of detecting a species on the site is going to be that P based on that R and this value of N. So what they did is they said, okay, we're gonna assume that N is drawn from a Poisson distribution, that every site has some detection pro or some number of animals on it based on a Poisson distribution, and we're gonna just basically integrate out the Poisson distribution just like we integrate out a random effect the other day numerically. And so their model then comes back with two parameters. One is R, the probability that an individual is detected. And then second parameter is this lambda. It's a probability that, it's a, it's a probability, it's not a probability. It's a mean number of species in this Poisson, mean number of individuals in a Poisson distribution. Now, a bunch of people immediately jumped to the conclusion that you could estimate population density now. You could say, oh, that lambda value that comes out of the Poisson distribution, lambda is the mean of a Poisson distribution. It's been that way since Poisson developed the distribution back in 1700s. <laughs> Another lambda. But anyway, the mean of the Poisson distribution, you say, well, that's my mean density out there across this area that we're trying to survey. That's a terrible assumption. Uh, a lot of people jump to that conclusion, but it's, it's invalid. It's also what led to the in-mixture models, which I think I mentioned the other day, there's just a paper just now coming out that shows that those things are just a crude index at best. And that's what that lambda is, it's just a crude index. Don't wanna get, any, don't wanna get carried away with it. It's, it might give you some idea, but uh, it's not something that's gonna be a population estimate. Um, to pursue this thing just a bit further, there's your Poisson distribution. For those of you that know what a Poisson distribution looks like, there's that lambda that I'm talking about. Um, and so there's some example Poisson distributions plotted there in the graph, what they look like in terms of the kind of variation you might expect. And um, the Poisson distributions used in statistics a lot. And the reason why is because it's a single parameter distribution. <coughs> Remember that you heard about the Poisson distribution, they said the mean and the variance are equal. I'm 
not getting any feedback. Nobody, okay, well, <laughs> in the Poisson distribution, the mean and the variance are equal. Take my word for it. Poisson figured that out years ago. And uh, it's an integer. It has to be an integer. So you go out and you get counts. And lots of counts you'd think ought to follow a Poisson distribution. They don't because the mean and the variance are not equal. There's heterogeneity out there. And so even though statisticians like to use this distribution, it's not particularly useful for the kind of stuff we do because the kind of counts we get are seldom Poisson. I'll say basically never Poisson distributed. It just doesn't happen. There's heterogeneity out there that, that precludes the Poisson distribution ever working. So that all sounds, well, I would say that this Royal Nichols model is a perfect example of George Box's statement, all models are wrong, some models are useful. This model turns out to be fairly useful because it tries to look at this individual heterogeneity across sites caused by differences in density. And so from that perspective, it's really useful. But if you want to take that lamb and start running with it, you're going to get, your, you're going to get burned. It isn't going to work. So um, the other option that I built into Mark is to use the negative binomial distribution, which is a two-parameter distribution. You no longer have this forced relationship between the mean and the variance, although there is a relationship inherent in the negative binomial between the mean and the variance. But they're not equal. And so you can actually run the Royal Nichols with the Poisson, and then you can turn around and run it with the with the uh, negative binomial. I did a little trick to make it easier for you to work that way. You run it with the Poisson, and you get a, an R and a lambda back. Now you can take those values and put those into the negative binomial, and it's got a third parameter. It's going to be the amount of additional variance that you want to add into. And then it'll try to optimize based on that. And it, it allows you to numerically jump up into the next step and maybe make some progress. Otherwise, a negative binomial distribution seldom fits just straight out. It, it's hard to fit that negative binomial distribution. So and in my experience, it seldom helped. If the Poisson model didn't fit well, then the negative binomial didn't cure the ills. So basically, you start off with just a straight Royal Nichols model, and then you can add in a a negative binomial to see if it helps, but um, basically the, the result of using the Royal Nichols model is you get some idea about how much of a density effect there is out there and how much of that individual heterogeneity you're explaining with the Poisson distribution. And then after that, you're, well, you're going to compare it against a basic model anyway, and you want to know whether that model fit better. Provide, AIC is going to provide, provide information on whether that's a better fit or not. So. Um, We'll demonstrate some examples of that. But yeah, in Mark, there's additional parameters, the amount of variance to add to the mean. So you start off with the mean equals the variance, and then when you go to the negative binomial, you'll add more variance in. In other words, what that's saying is that the number of individuals per site is, is a lot more variable than what a Poisson distribution would allow. We go to the negative binomial. <coughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> However, additional distribution assumptions strong. Build a ladder. I haven't told you my ladder story yet. There's a, a modeler and a biologist out walking around western Colorado, and they were in a heated debate about models and biology, and they weren't paying too much attention about where they're going, and they fell into a mine shaft, uh, one of those old mine shafts with lots of them out there. And they crashed down to the bottom, and they weren't particularly hurt, stunned a little bit for a bit. And uh, the modeler just kind of sat there in the corner, and the biologist was looking around like, well, okay, how are we going to get out of this place? And, and he, Bonnie realizes that they're trapped, and they can't get out of it. And he starts to panic. And turns to the modeler and says, man, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, we're trapped, and we're not going to get out, and we're going to die. And the monitor is still unperplexed. And he says, no, says, all we have to do is assume a ladder. 
Well, that's what we do with models. We make assumptions. <laughs> and we just make some big assumptions. And the Poisson's a big assumption. And uh, we want to keep our ladders small and short, like little step ladders that you stand up on to put a picture in the wall. We don't want to have one of these 89-story firehouse ladders that takes us to the top of the Empire State Building. And too often, that's what we're getting these days, is the, the models that people are using just aren't biologically realistic when you get down in the short roads and you really think about what they are. And examples of this are the, are the Poisson, when people say that they're going to use it to model density. Um, the paper will say that the distribution follows a Poisson. Well, you got to know what that means. What that means biologically is, is that the animals are randomly distributed, totally randomly distributed out there on a perfectly homogeneous plate table. That's what a Poisson distribution implies. It, it's like that blank wall, if we put a square up there and we could somehow put a bunch of random points just randomly up there, and then we drew little grids on it, the number of points per square would be a Poisson distribution. So originally, plant people, back in the early part of the 19th century, they were out there looking at plants to see if they're Poisson distributed in the environment. Well, of course they're not, because everything we do out there has got plants have to have certain conditions in order to grow. And there's never a perfectly homogeneous kind of an environment out there. That's why we have plant diversity. <laughs> and so uh, that Poisson distribution, when the, when the mathematician statistician says in the paper it's Poisson distributed, your antenna will immediately go up and say, now, whoa, what's that really mean? Well, it means that it's perfectly randomly distributed on a totally perfect, smooth, space. Doesn't work that way. And so um, my argument is that too many statisticians, modeler types, put their assumptions down mathematically, but they don't bother to explain what it means biologically. If they explain it biologically, you'd yell tilt. You'd say, no, this isn't right. We know better. Plants are not distributed out there on a Poisson distribution, as an example. <clears throat> and so, so anyway, that's my soapbox for this morning for a while. Uh, too often we just accept these assumptions because they, they're written down mathematically and they look nice, but you don't know what they mean. You need to understand biologically what they mean, not mathematically. Okay, occupancy. Let's, yeah. When you're talking about using abundance to uh, improve your estimates of P, you have density or abundance estimates. Can you use that information to? improve those P estimates instead of just making assumptions about what they are or trying to model that? Well, you've already got, uh, if, you had, if you had density estimates, then you'd already know your occupancy, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, you can go out one time and catch 15 things or see 15 things and it's still gone. But the next time you only went out and found one animal, it's yeah. still a one because it was yeah. still there. So can you yeah. use that information, either uh, yeah, actually, individual observations or an average somehow to? <coughs> yeah, Royal came out with another, another set of models later on, which I also put in, <coughs> that used the count of animals you saw. And that's an idea, try to get a little closer to that. Um, and well, one place we've used those uh, analyzing the breeding bird survey data, for what it's worth. You've got a route, and you know how many birds you counted on that route, say, of a species. So obviously, if you count anything more than zero, then you, you know it's occupied. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it can be used. Where you actually use the count of animals you saw in the model, as opposed to just in the Poisson and Royal Nichols model, you don't use the counts. You just you just estimate this Poisson distribution, or you use this Poisson distribution as a latent distribution to integrate it out. Mark literally has a summation sum in there that sums until it basically sums up all the probability out of that Poisson distribution. That's the integration part. But the other, other models, you would actually enter the number of animals you saw. And so I don't know whether we talk about those. There's some examples of it out there. And I think there's some breeding bird survey examples. I got some breeding bird survey examples for occupancy you can work on if somebody's into that. 
What yeah. model was that again? Uh, it's an extension that we, it's the Royal model with counts. I forget, I will, when we bring up the list of occupancy models, we'll, we'll try to identify it. Okay, that's correct. Okay, single season occupancy. What is a season? Well, normally we think of these things in years, but maybe the seasons are months or weeks or who knows, all right? And you gotta define your sampling unit. That's your site. Now maybe it's gonna be a pond, maybe it's gonna be a, a woodlot, but you, in theory, if you're gonna make inferences to the whole population of those woodlots or those whole population of ponds or this whole population of sites, you've gotta have a, a population that you can draw from to take a random sample. That's selecting the sampling units. You've got to have repeat surveys, trying to avoid heterogeneity as much as you can. And then the question becomes now, should we do more units or more surveys? That's the big one that we're going to talk about. In other words, you could sample 100 sites four times, or you could sample 200 sites two times, which is more efficient. Well, we statisticians have our ways. I'll show you <laughs> how you decide that question. Um, another point that just went by me quickly. Uh, oh, yeah. Sites. Suppose it really is, it's just a geographic site. Like I said, a one kilometer block for prey dogs. <coughs> Somebody else comes along and they do, uh, let's say they do one square mile blocks. How do you relate the size between those two surveys? Anybody want to guess? Well, you think, well, okay, square miles are, or miles 1.6 kilometers, you ought to be able to scale it up, right? You can. When we, when we compare, when we do occupancy surveys on on fixed spatial sites, on a fixed size, like one kilometer versus half a kilometer versus square mile, um, they don't scale. You just can't move between them. And so uh, this has gotten a lot of people in trouble because somebody designs a survey and they do it on a one kilometer scale and somebody else comes along and says, oh, I think we ought to do it on a half kilometer scale. The problem is the size aren't comparable. You can't, you can't move between them. And so you've got to be very careful about how you define your sampling unit. What is a season? Yeah, I don't know. That's, that usually is fairly obvious, I think, but not always. Natural definition, breeding season. Now, you've got to be careful about mobile species, migrations and stuff like that, the closure issue, ecology of the species. How to define a sampling unit. This is the one that... This is the one that's interesting. Uh, size matters. <laughs> uh, so here's a little diagram that makes that point I just said. If you have these four sampling units, then they're all occupied. But when you break it up into a quarter of that size, now you've got a size that's less than one. Okay? And you can't move between those scales. That's, that's the hideous part of it. You'd like to think you could, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. So that's just an issue if you're trying to compare spatial. The yeah. probability of occupying one of those squares on the left versus one of the squares. Right, right. You can't do it. It's like saying that I'm going to use sampling units the size of the state of Colorado. Well, they're all going to be occupied. But if I start breaking it down into townships or right. sections or all of a sudden they're not occupied anymore. And you just can't scale up like that. That's the problem. You can't, you can't come over here and say, well, because what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine out of 16. So psi here would be, the truth psi would be nine out of 16. We can't take that number and come over here and say, well, therefore this is gonna be one. It just doesn't work. You just can't move that way. And so, so definition of your sampling unit is really pretty key. And if, if there's some previous work been done, you may be sort of 
walked into doing the same kind of a survey that was done previously if you want to compare it. Yeah, it's uh, been more than one study just basically ruined because of that little problem right there. Well, not a little problem, big problem. Here, so if you're sampling wetlands that are all variable in size instead of nice yeah. square grids, is that, is that a problem that, that all, every one of your sampling units is a different size? Yep. And so a lot of times what you do is you use the covariate of size to try to remove the heterogeneity, but also then that, that well, obviously the probability of something being occupied is if it's a function of the size of the wetland, almost always would be. Sure. Well, it can go the other way too. I mean, it might be quite a mm -hmm. quadratic looking curve. Yep. So, yeah. But yeah, in that case, so I mean, we, we have a map of wetlands more or less. Well, <laughs> that's always, yeah, in theory, we got a map of wetlands. <laughs> uh, that's a lousy sampling unit, is what I would say. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, we, sometimes we have to use it. Um, so, Gary, are you going to talk a little bit about advice for um, proportions of sites that you'd like to have occupied? In other words, we, when we get to when we get to the uh, the big table. Okay. Will, All right. Yeah, that's. Yeah, you kind of want to you want to be clever about what proportion of your sites you think are going to be occupied. I mean, you can adjust that based on the size. Maybe, maybe you got enough prior knowledge. <coughs> So how to define a sampling unit, natural definition, what scale do you want to measure occupancy, species territorial, uh, density, size of a home range, question driven management, yeah. Selecting sampling units, in theory again, I mean you want to do a random sample. And you might want to do a stratified random sample. When we were doing spotted owls, Mexican spotted owls, we stratified the sample. We had areas that we... Uh, Ponderosa Pine Canyon country, we knew that, that had high pro higher probability of having owls, and so we used uh, a stratified survey, that versus a pinyon country that we're pretty sure there weren't going to be a lot of owls, but a few. So you can, you can set up a stratified sample. It's not like you have to uh, uh, just have a simple random sample. You can have a stratified random sample. Repeat surveys. Yeah, it does not necessarily imply repeat visits, but I think in the big picture, you're better off to do repeat visits if you can make it work. <coughs> repeat surveys. Closure, randomness, independence, and heterogeneity. What if oxygen changes, lack of closure? Uh, that's what I talked about early on. You, you don't get occupancy back, you get whether the units used by the species. And that's, that's a very different quantity. Probably not something you're necessarily interested in. Maybe you are, maybe that's all you care about. Is it used? Lack of independence, uh, yeah. We can, yeah, some forms of dependence can be accommodated through study design. That's a removal example that I talked about earlier a little bit. We'll maybe come back to that. Avoiding heterogeneity, yeah. Again, if you know that you've got observer issues, you want to make darn sure that your observers are set up in a way that you can take out the observer effect. Allocation of effort, okay. Here's the big table I just mentioned and the point Steve's making. So you got psi across the top, and so psi can vary, well, 0.1 to 0.9, we, 0 <coughs> to 1 in all cases. P goes from 0.1 to 0.9. And this is how many surveys you should do in order to estimate P and psi precise. This will give you the most precise estimate of psi effectively. So let's get down here in the middle of the table where it's, or down here at the bottom where it's sort of interesting <coughs> and then we'll get up in the corners. What we're saying is for everything down, down in here and below, when you got a P of 0 0.7 up to 0 0.9, two surveys will work no matter what psi is. Well, actually over here you get three. Psi is 0.8 and 0.9. Let me think now. I got to get my intuition going again. Why is it that when you have psi at 0.8 and 0.9, with 
<laughs> I never been able to explain why there's 34 in that upper corner. It always escapes me. And I go back and study the formula and I sort of get it figured out, but then I forget it again. Anyway, this is your optimal number of samples to take. So Steve's point a minute ago was, well, you can manipulate psi a little bit if you kind of know what you're doing here. And so uh, if you were, if you say you thought your detection probability is going to be about 0.4, you might want to use slightly smaller units because you get in this neighborhood of 3 and 4, whereas if you get a really large unit, the optimal allocation is 7. You can see that that, whole, that trend kind of holds all the way across. If you get psi too big, it takes a lot more repeat visits until you get clear down here in order to get a, a precise estimate. So you can manipulate psi and p. Yeah. But you're trying to estimate psi and p. Yeah. So well, how do you... Anytime you design something, you got to know the answer ahead of time. <laughs> so if you had like a species, you're trying to model the occupancy of a rare species. Yeah. Did you just assume... I'd assume it's over here somewhere. Okay. So you have to make some. some yeah, it's really rare. But um, now, what I'm saying here is just a little bit ambiguous. <laughs> because let, let's take your rare species. If I survey a big enough plot, most of them will have that species. Okay, so. Instead of surveying a one kilometer plot, I survey a, a 10 by 10 kilometer plot, 100 kilometers squared. Well, my P is going to go way low when I do that. So your P is a function of the size of the plot you use. So you have to work all that out somehow. I mean, study design always comes down. You've got to know the answer. And then you can do an optimal design. So that's why we do pilot studies. Uh, but yeah. You can manipulate the size of your plot, but you also, in the process, you manipulate P, too, maybe unintentionally. Or maybe intentionally. Obviously, if you get a small enough plot, you've got a much higher probability of detection. But your size is going to be really low. You get a lot bigger plot, your P goes down. So you're going to be jumping around that table on different rows and columns. But in generalities, as detection probabilities decreases, optimal number of surveys increases. As occupancy increases, optimal number of surveys increase. That is not intuitive. <laughs> I just don't, I never can think out why that is. All right, consider rare species. Any site may have a low probability of occupancy. Spending many resources to confirm this is inefficient. For common species, expending resources to confirm presence may be worthwhile rather than unconfirmed presence moving on to a different site. That's kind of the logic that's behind it, summarized. All right, so then once you've got your number of surveys, repeat surveys you're going to do, this is how many sampling units you can survey. So U is the number of units you're going to survey. And so you want some variance on psi. And p star, you've seen p star before. 1 minus 1. There's your p stars. There's the formula. So let's just work through it in an example, a couple examples. So you think psi is going to be about 0.7. And p is about 0.4. You should use five, five, five surveys per unit. So let's go back and verify that. 0.7. Point four, there we are, five, right? Everybody follow that? Go back over here. So P star, that's point four raised to the, one point six raised to the fifth, one minus that's point nine two. That's P star. In other words, that's the probability you're going to detect them one or more times when you survey five times. 
right? That's what P star is. So in order to achieve a standard error of 0.04 on psi, in other words, we're saying that we want to have an estimate somewhere between 0.62 up to 0.78, approximately. That's our confidence there, what we're going to be willing to live with. In order to get that, <coughs> this is what it's going to take. We plug in our 0.04 squared, and we solve for u. It's going to take 183 plots sites. So it's all laid out for you. This stuff is all in the, uh, the book. By the way, there's a new edition of the book coming out. The rest of the other day was reading page proofs of it. So it's going to be out here shortly. So don't bother to buy the old one. Just wait another few weeks and you'll be able to get the new one. And it's going to have a bunch of the newer models in it too. Stuff that's come out since the original book. And there's been a lot come out. I mean, yeah, anyway, these guys have been working actively on it. So, okay, questions about the sampling design and this sample size stuff. Yeah. Go back to the big, big table. So why is the probability that the size increase is more likely to be there? Yeah. But you need more samples. Seems kind of, I, guess, I know, and that's what this is trying to explain right here. It's not intuitive. Consider rare species. Any site may have a low probability of occupancy. Expending many resources to confirm this is inefficient. Oh. All right, in the other case, you, um, when it has a high probability of occupancy and you got a low P, you want to expend a lot of resources to def definitely show it's there. I mean, that's the flip side of the other argument if it's rare. All I can tell you is there's a formula that. that well, they what, if what, what if it is really rare if it's and a, you have a low probability, but you really want to. Then you're into the 14 range. But it's really important to find it, so you're not worried about inefficiency, you're worried about. Uh, well, even there. If it's. Even there, you're better off to, to do a, well, 14 surveys is a horrendous amount of surveys. So you're starting to break down. If it's that rare, when you're looking for a needle in a haystack, good luck. <laughs> That's just kind of what happens. Uh, when it gets really rare, You're not going to pinpoint where it is. What you're—I mean, again, this this psi estimate isn't to say it is or isn't in a site. It's to say what's the probability that it's there. And when you bring in your code rates, then you can really do a much better job. I don't know what else to say. It's kind of a weird deal. When you get this needle in the haystack problem, it's yeah, you can never identify which sites have it, which don't. Of course, then we get into the whole critical habitat kind of stuff and what we ought to preserve. And I know. <laughs> I know where you're headed, but I can't help you. <laughs> yeah, another question. On one of the previous slides, uh, when you were talking about the lack of closure, yeah. using it to find if a unit is used by a species. Lack of closure right there. This one? Yep. Um, so we've got a study design where we're looking at how Gizzard Shed used this embayment area for overwinter survival. We have a tag with telemetry tags with passive receivers out there. Could that be your, you know, like your yeah. unit with a passive yeah. receiver in Could there? Could be, yeah. I mean, using camera traps is one of the common deals now. It's so, another example. So it would kind of be like the fisheries version of doing that with the camera traps? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example where they... Well, I guess this isn't a very good example, but because um, it's not really a survey, but the jaguars coming across the border from Mexico into southern New Mexico, they, they've been using camera traps for years on those guys, and they detect them periodically and have a big uproar. And of course, the border fence has been right at the center of that, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, camera traps have really provided a, another, you know, really useful. 
So when you have that, you, you're pretty much continuously sampling. How do you set your discrete sampling units? Well, you One day? kind of no, you uh, well, yeah. Uh, let's see. I got to think for a second. Um, they actually do a couple different things. They'll have multiple cameras per site, so you got some spatial and temporal replication there. And but uh, yeah, a lot of times you'll say, okay, what's the probability we observed it per day or per week or something like that? Whatever the whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see in the next few years some models coming out that are continuous time for this sort of stuff. You know, everything we're talking about here, we're talking about discrete time, fixed intervals and stuff. But I, I think that, that there's enough of this continuous work being done with GPS collars and, and then with uh, camera traps where you've got continuous time basically. And so I think you're going to see more and more where we're coming out with models that use these time variables as opposed to the way I would analyze it the mark where I just discretize the whole thing. So I think that's something you want to keep an eye out on. And maybe somebody will come along and write some more software to do it. <laughs> Here, when you have an animal that has a fairly large home range, uh -huh. How do you optimize your sample size or your, you know, your, your, your site size? size? Yeah, yeah that, that gets to be tough. Um, you don't want to have a, a site, site that's so small that, that an animal could occupy like six or eight of them, uh, a single individual. So you probably want to have a, a sampling unit that's, that's big, if not bigger than the home range. That doesn't mean that they won't occupy two, because they always will. I mean, there's always a chance that they'll be across two. But, but uh, um, you want to try to, well, it depends. I mean, again, let's make one other point. Occupancy does not give you population sizes. The second point, occupancy is not necessarily a good monitor of population change. And when I say that, what I'm thinking is that, um, you can have a species as the population changes. Get to play games here again. Got camp. You can have a species that occupies some area. And then as the population increases, that area expands. Or it contracts back down later on. All right? Occupancy is great for that. But if a species population just goes up and down within the same area, occupancy may not be a good monitor of population change at all, okay? So if, if, they, if the, the range of the species doesn't really change, but the density just goes up and down, occupancy is a lousy estimator or a lousy monitor for population change. A lot of people don't really think that through. They just immediately think, oh boy, occupancy, great, we can monitor a species. Well, yes and no. It depends on what these population dynamics are doing. Um, grizzly bears in Yellowstone, their density has been pretty constant in Yellowstone National Park since 30, 40 years ago. But their range has expanded considerably. That's what the population dynamics show. So if you'd been doing density estimate, or if you'd have been doing occupancy modeling inside the Yellowstone National Park, you'd conclude that they'd never changed one iota. But if you would have had sites outside Yellowstone, you'd have seen that they gradually expanded. So you got to think about it. You got to think about what's going on with the population dynamics of your species of interest. Is it one of these that just goes up and down within one area, or is it expanding and contracting? Yeah. Do you have species that, like fish that school or fish grab on packs, how does that violate your independence? Nope. That's nope because you're not sampling individuals, you're sampling the species, the, did you detect or not detect the species? Yeah. So, no, that makes it easy for occupancy. It might violate your population estimation stuff, but not here. Yeah. Does that increase P? Increase P? Yeah, when they're schooling or they're... Yeah, and that's where that Royal Nichols model could come in, where you, the R and Lambda model. 
Yeah. Anyway, you, I mean, occupancy gets thrown out there as just a cure-all for monitoring because it's cheap and easy. Eh, well, you don't necessarily get something for nothing. So you want to be, you want to think about what's going on here. I mean, what, what, you know, uh, um, well, my favorite, unfavorite topic at the moment: thistles. <laughs> think about Canada thistles in this state, and you know when they're not controlled, you're going to have cotton everywhere. When you have really heavy control, all you're going to have is a whole lot of little tiny thistles hidden away, but they're still there. You're still occupied. So your occupancy rate is probably still going to be 100%. <laughs> My CRP patches that I'm spraying is going to have 100% occupancy no matter how much I work at it. <laughs> I already figured that out. But I want it to be a really low level of occupancy. I don't want to have a big white cotton out there every year. Okay? So there's another example. If I were using occupancy to model thistles in the state of Iowa, it'd be 100% guaranteed. <laughs> Even with Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, it'd still be 100%. Because <laughs> there, I don't know, you guys, you're not farmers. I'm a farmer now. See, I even got a little sticker in my computer that says I'm a farmer. <laughs> uh, you look in this Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, and they're spraying Roundup on these thistles, and it doesn't kill them. They're still out there. They're not very healthy, but they're there. Which sort of amazes me. Well, they're probably becoming Roundup ready, like a lot of other weeds. So anyhow, I like my thistle example. That's a good one. You, you could you could do occupancy on thistles, and it would be 100 <laughs> percent. Anyway, all right. What else? Dot cam. Let's go back to non-standard designs. Here's where some of these weirdo things come in. Uh, repeatedly surveying subset of units elsewhere visiting only once does not generally provide a more efficient design. I, that was the first thing I thought of long before this table came out. I thought, oh, God, how about you go out and you do 100, serve, you know, 100 plots where you survey them three times, and then you got another 300 where you only go once, assuming they're all kind of the same. You ought to be a lot more efficient and get a more efficient estimate of psi. Wrong. I mean, by simulation, I proved to myself that no, it didn't work. And then later on, when the table that I showed you came out in the book, sure enough, it doesn't work. Um, another one is, is surveying a unit repeatedly until first detection up to a maximum, you <coughs> provide more efficient design, but maybe less efficient. And that's true, less robust. <coughs> may provide a more efficient design, but may be less robust. Um, yeah, note the optimal maximum number is higher than the values given in the previous table. So if you're going out there 38 times, you're going to wear a trail. <laughs> uh, that isn't going to work. So it, basically, the, that optimal design, again, is these, that table that I showed you. General effort recommendations on allocating efforts, uh, at least three units, yeah. Basically, if you've got a situation where you've got to go out there more than three or four times, you, you probably ought to think about doing something different. So here's another slide about this optimal allocation. Surveying 200, if you've got psi of 0.4 and p of 0.3, surveying 200 units twice gives standard error on psi of 0.11. 80 units five times gives a 0.07. That ought to sink home. And you know, again, you're looking at an average size. Now, um, that doesn't take into account when you start thinking about covariates. It may be that you want to Yeah, you start talking about how to optimally design with a good covariate, like say the short grass prairie predictor on, on Swiftbox. And uh, that'd be a different ball game too. I haven't seen anybody really discuss that allocation problem when you got a good covariate, and you know it's a good covariate, how you optimally allocate when you pull your sample, because you, you know your covariate from your population. So for example, on Swift Foxes, we've got the entire 
South, uh, Eastern Colorado all surveyed out into our plots, and we know the percent Swiss uh, shortgrass prairie on each one of those sites, those sampling units. When we pull the sample, should we just take a random sample, or should we kind of weight it by the uh, percent shortgrass prairie? I don't know the answer to that. It'd be a good sampling problem for somebody. Maybe there's something that's discussed in the new book on that. That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about it. I know when I did it, I didn't do anything with the design. I just did the data analysis. But in hindsight, how would I go about doing it? I don't know. OK, final comments. Uh, tends to be iterative affair, simulation, pilot studies can provide useful information. Yeah, nothing new there. OK, that's for just a single season, meaning you're going to go out once and you're going to get one estimate aside. The much more interesting stuff is this, where you have multiple surveys. So you got this sample, U sampling units are selected and surveyed. You do a survey. You come back again next season, next year, think of. And you survey them again. And you keep doing that. So now it's like Pollock's robust design. I mean, you can see how people immediately jumped into this. Uh, so you got these primary samples, or your seasons. And you got your secondary samples and surveys within season. So you get a bunch of data that look like this, where they went out and surveyed three times, and you've got these sites, one through U, and you've got seasons, one through T, and you've got these encounter histories for each of these guys. And they don't all, you can have dots in them and stuff like that, too. You don't have to have them all the same. An alternative way that's not as efficient, well, it, I've got to be careful here. It depends on what your goal is. This initial survey, or this initial example, allows us to estimate some really nice parameters, colonization and extinction, because we've got these same plots that we're monitoring through time. So here's a, a plot that was not occupied, or at least not detected, may have not been occupied, and then suddenly it became occupied. It was colonized. Over here, maybe we had, it was occupied and then it went extinct or the species went extinct on that site. Those colonization extinction probabilities, again, they're a function of the size of your plot, the size of your sampling unit, or by definition what your sampling unit is. But they're very interesting because you give you some dy dynamics that you can't possibly get in any way. The scenario that we're showing here where you just sort of take a different sample every year, maybe you resample a few of the same and some not, that doesn't provide this information on extinction and colonization that turns out to be really interesting. So how do we model this multi-season data? Uh, what I'm going to show you is this dynamic model. Uh, <coughs> then I want to look at, well, let's just go right to the throat for it, right here. We got, we got this plot, and they're occupied or not occupied, and they jump back and forth between. So colonization, you go up. Extinction, you come down. If you not colonized, you remain not colonized, and if you're occupied you're, and you don't go extinct, you remain occupied, okay? So the parameters that we use on these are epsilon for extinction, I went back a slide, and we got gamma for colonization, okay? And they're time specific. And this lambda for this ratio of the size turns out not to be very interesting, probably ought to scratch that out. Uh, we use some different metrics for that now. So that's the robust design kind of a thing. Okay? We had that yesterday. It ought to be easy enough to soak up. Yeah, we got a bunch of slides here about a robust design, but you guys already kind of know about a robust design now, right? In fact, that slide looks very familiar too. Okay? But now, see, instead of presence or absence, well, instead of uh, 
available for sampling versus not available for sampling. It's whether you're present or absent, whether the species is present or absent. So your gamma, your gamma prime, gamma double prime now became epsilon and epsilon and gamma. <laughs> it's another gamma. All right, let's go back and just make sure we're on the same page. This gamma is probability that it's if it's not present. If it's not present, in other words, if it's absent, what's the probability it becomes present? What's the probability it's colonized? Why they couldn't have used a C and an E, I don't know. <laughs> that would have been a lot easier to think about. You could have remembered them. Whatever. They used an epsilon and a gamma. <laughs> You just got to load it in your head. Okay, this is a different gamma. Today's gamma <coughs> is colonization. Gamma of the day. <laughs> and the psi of the day. <laughs> uh, so, local extinction and colonization take place between these primary periods. We're closed within a same kind of an assumption. Um, so here's a history, and in this case we've got two secondaries per primary. They put little spaces in here, but the history and mark would be all pushed together, squished together. And so you've got these, these combinations, one zero, zero, one, 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 presence, interior zero, zero. That means it was, could have been occupied but not detected, or it could have been not occupied, local extinct. Or, colonized later. That's what that zero zero is all about. Uh, there's the same history and so um, probability persistence is one minus epsilon. Gamma is a probability of colonization. So here's our here's our encounter history. You can kind of get a feel for these parameters. <coughs> the P stars. Um, well the P's in there but okay we know the site started off occupied because we detected it the first year. So we got a Psi 1, and we got our, our P11 because it was detected, and it's not detected at 1, 2. So that's what that 0 is. So there's our P11, 1 minus P12, okay? That explains that 1, 0. Now, we got this 0, 0 in here. There's two ways that could have happened. One is, is that it did not go extinct. 1 minus epsilon means it did not go extinct. It was not found with probability 1 minus p star. In other words, it's, it's 1 minus p21 times 1 minus p22, 1 minus that. That's what p star is. So it was not found with probability p star. And it did not go extinct again. In other words, if it was not extinct now, it can't go extinct because it was occupied the next one. So that's why we got this second epsilon 2 in here. Okay. All right, that explains that zero as if it was just not detected. Right? Over here says it went extinct, and then it came back, it was recolonized. So epsilon times gamma. Look at that for a minute. Okay. And just to be clear, that epsilon occurs before the two zeros, and the gamma yeah. occurs after it. So right. they don't happen at the same time. Epsilon one and gamma two. Yeah. And then you've got the one one. We saw it on three one and three two, so that's why the one one. It did not go extinct because it was still occupied on the fourth occasion. So that's why we have a one minus epsilon three, and then we have a one minus P41, P42. Again, it's not that you've got to understand or be able to write these things out. It's just that you've got to get a good feel in your head about what these different parameters mean. Mark does all this for you, obviously. But you've got to be able to, to understand what the epsilons and gammas and p's and psi's are all about. Yeah. So if it was just a string of zeros after that first one zero, it would be that there'd be no gamma, it would just be that, that continual oscillator, not connected string until the end. 
Uh, no, because, I mean, even if it started off 0, 0, 0, 0, there's still some probability it's occupied and not detected. There's all kinds of dynamics going on that's possible in there. I mean, it would be, it'd be a nightmare to write it out in the equipment on a nightmare, but we could, we could do it. It'd take a while to get it right. Uh, the way all this stuff's done is matrix algebra. So inside Mark, there's, there's a matrix, uh, a two by two matrix. And it's just, you multiply it times the current state, and it cranks those things out. It takes, takes care of all your possibilities. And in fact, the way these papers are all written up, they show them as matrices. So you don't write them out like this. This just sort of helps you understand it when you look at it. But if you had to write out all possible combinations, you'd fill the whole board full. Because the matrix does that for you. And since I assume most of you haven't had any matrix algebra and matrix theory, other than just the very simple how to multiply two matrices and simple stuff. So it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. But, but the, the important part is the interpretation of parameters, what they mean. Epsilon is a probability of going state. Gamma is a probability of colonizing. Covariates again. You got season specific. You got survey specific on P. The reason why I, I like this particular model is because these covariates on extinctions and colonizations are, they make a lot of sense, you know. The probability of being occupied is one thing, but now this is sort of like yesterday's Predell models when we're looking at P and F. We get covariates that model the actual process. So what causes the site to go extinct? Well, I've been doing a lot of work with the Rio Grande, Sil Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, a little, little little bitty guy that's in the Rio Grande River, a little Cochiti Dam down to about an uh, Elephant Butte Reservoir. And one of the things that makes them go extinct is the river dries up. <laughs> that was a pretty good one. <laughs> one of the things that allows them to colonize, we get a lot of water. <laughs> uh, that's sort of a naive one, but you know, you, you can think about what allows a species to expand and contract or whatever, you know, which cause these sites to blink on and blink off. And so it makes sense that you actually do your, your covariates at a scale, <coughs> at a level in the process that makes good sense. So instead of just modeling psi, think about, well, yeah, what causes them to go extinct and what causes them to be colonized? <coughs> and get at the root of the process instead of kind of like second level up at psi. Okay, mean assumptions. Yeah, can't violate closure. <laughs> We're going to handle heterogeneity again with colonization, extinction of covariates, and all that kind of good stuff again. Here's some presence absence. Model permit, yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop here because what comes next is a bunch of other stuff and until we've done a little bit of this. And I don't know how many people are going to be interested in, in all the, there's all these extensions now, at least this basic set of models that I've described that I'm going to show you. Uh, Multi-species, multi-state. Uh, multi uh, <laughs> there's a tiger on trails model. And what that is is when your sites are not independent. Uh, there's a false positives model out there, but again, it's not all that useful. Well, you'll see a list of questions on anything before I get out of the slides. I think we probably ought to take a short break and then come back and I'll, I'll open up Mark and show you how to do stuff in Mark. So let's do that. All right, let's get going again. <laughs> uh, all right, so you open up Mark, file new, and there's three different blocks over here that have occupancy stuff in them. We've got the regular occupancy estimation, single, se single season. We've got the two species stuff that I'm not going to touch on now. And we got the open, robust design. Uh, 
robust design occupancy, sorry. I jumped too far. So let me first go through the, we'll do some occupancy estimation, then I'll come back. By the way, before, uh, before I go any further, there's a whole series of occupancy examples out here. If you go to your CD and you open up workshop examples, go to that index file and open it up in your browser, open up workshop examples and space down, um, you've got occupancy examples. Open it up. This Palm Springs ground squirrel is the only one I had for a long time, but uh, I don't like it particularly. I put in this Swiftbox one. There's two different examples of it in there, and we'll do one of those as an example now. <clears throat> Here's a northern spotted owl robust design that came out of McKinsey et al. 2003, the original paper. Here's another tiger salamander occupancy. And I think, I think it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a robust design also. That's what the data look like there. That'll make you, you talk about dots. <laughs> Looks like they miss more plots than they got, but anyway. Um, and so then we've got the two species, or two species, one example of that. And then we've got a whole bunch of stuff um, for breeding bird survey data. And uh, <coughs> I'm not sure what any of those have got counts in them or not. Let's just look and see. No, they're not. None of them are counts. Hmm. I'm not sure I got any count examples, Mike. I'll show you where the files are, what they look like. Well, I'll show you some the mo models, I mean. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind because there's a bunch of stuff you can come out here and play with. All right. <clears throat> Let's go back into Mark here. Uh, when we click on occupancy estimation, now, there's a whole list of these things. Here's just your basic occupancy model. There's the mixture model, heterogeneity. There's the Royal Nichols Poisson abundance, Royal Nichols with negative binomial abundance. Here are the two count models. They're not compatible likelihoods. They're different likelihoods. So they're, they're tucked in here, but they if you pick those, you're going to get a different likelihood. And well, they're a completely different format in the data. You got the multi-state occupancy estimation. That's the case where you have like different states. So the primary example we use are, are well, spotted owls. They're, there's a single present, there's a pair present, they've got young. So you got three states. Would be an example. They usually they got to be ordered something like that. Then we have multi-scale occupancy estimation. What that's all about is uh, <clears throat> you've got a, let's suppose you sample national wildlife refuges and you sample ponds within refuge to look for HIV positive water. Not HIV, H1N1. <laughs> H1N1. I'll get it right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long week, folks. <laughs> Going to get worse tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, uh, this came back during the big bird scare, and so H1N1, uh, the virus, and so bird virus. So uh, uh, you got ponds within refuges. You want to have an occupancy rate for the refuge, and then you want to have an occupancy rate by pond. So that's multi-scale as an example. The, the bird folks, one of their favorite tricks is they pick out like say one square mile or even they'll do townships sometimes and then within townships or within one square mile blocks they'll do multiple surveys within that in smaller squares. So try to get around this whole issue about uh, your, your, your size not being comparable across areas of sampling units of different sizes. So anyway, that's the multi-scale. Occupancy with correlated detections, I think of that as a Tigers on Trails model because that's where Jim Hines first put it together. Uh, they were monitoring tigers in India and they're walking trails. And if you find a, a scat sample on the trail, the odds are pretty good you're going to find more because the, the tiger's going to walk down the trail and leave a, a series of samples for you to detect in each, <coughs> each uh, block. So they're correlated detections. And then occupancy with relaxed closures. Um, relaxed closure, that's all I can say. I don't remember all the details of it. 
And then we got occupancy estimation with detection less than one and random effects. That's my random effects, my logit normal model, my favorite. And then we've got occupancy estimation with false positive identifications. In order to have false positive, I didn't make a big deal about this, but in order to have false positives, you've got to have some cases where you know it's not a false positive so that you can estimate this rate of false detections. And it's, it's not a very useful model. Well, if you've got false positives, you're in trouble. Let's <laughs> just put it that way. You just want to try to not have that. But this is an attempt to get around it, but you'll find out it's not a very efficient model. So let's just go into the simple, simple one first. Um, let's figure out if I can find a data set first. Go find my SwiftFox data. SwiftFox single season covariates. Uh, we'll do the original Finley one. It's the, the complicated one. So let's look at the data. View file. Okay, we have 72 plots. They're 31.2 square miles, kilometers each. In other words, they were a township, as I remember. Would that be about right? Yeah, it sounds right. Eight observations per trapping session, but you can see a lot of them didn't do that. Uh, we've got four covariates. Now, this survey was carried out over a period of a year. It was a grad student at the University of Northern Colorado, and he went to work for the Colorado Division of Wildlife, and I found out about his master's thesis, and I said, well, we can analyze this with occupancy data. And, oh, cool. So we got a paper out of it in, on doing occupancy analysis, and these are the different units. But the four covariates are month, and then we've got the sine of month and the cosine of month. Why do I have those in there? Well, things like month that are cyclic, you know, January, February, you keep going to get to December, then it's got to trail right back into January at the same level. You don't want it to be discrete or disjunct there, right? So one of the tricks there is to use sine and cosine functions to force a covariate that, that maybe it peaks out in the summer and then goes down in the winter, but it comes back, and so you get this nice cyclic effect. And that's what those covariates do for you. But the one that we're really after is right here, proportion of short grass prairie on plot. So here's the Bonnie Reservoir uh, site. We never <coughs> detected any foxes. They surveyed it three times and did not survey it the last uh, five times. There's your, your count. Month 10 would be October. There's the sign of that month, which has been properly transformed. I, I won't tell you about all the details I did to do that. You can go read the original paper there. There's the cosine, and there's a proportion of short grass prairie. So as you just kind of look down through there, you quickly figure out that the ones that have zero almost always have all zeros. <laughs> and the ones that have big values, like say there, almost always have occupied. Gives you your first clue. OK, so that's what the data look like. And so let's see, I've got eight occasions. So this is going to be uh, uh, Finley et al. Swift Fox. And we have uh, single season covariates. New. And we have eight. Set time intervals is grayed out because it's closed. There's no concept of time. Right? Yeah, th these things were surveyed on different months. The plots were surveyed on different months. I guess I didn't make that quite clear. They were surveyed in consecutive days. The way, the way he surveyed them is he put out uh, traps, uh, little fox traps, swift foxes, those nice, cute little guys. And they baited, baited them up with chicken. Back then, you could do that kind of stuff. Uh, so he got chicken from the grocery store that was being ready to be thrown out. Nowadays, they wouldn't want you doing that out there. But So he put the chicken in the trap and caught the foxes. Or he could detect that they were there. Sometimes they'd taken the chicken and see tracks. But mostly, he caught them. He physically caught the things. So he was trapping for like eight consecutive nights. Well, most of the time, he didn't trap for eight consecutive nights, as the data show. Uh, so there's, anyway, the point is, there's no time intervals in occupancy within a primary because they're closed. No concept of time. 
Attribute groups one, covariates, we got four. And so they were month, uh, sign of month, Co oops, what did I do? Only press three. Let me cancel. Yeah. Month. Sign of month. Oops. Got a J on the end of that. Cosine of month. And proportion. Short grass prairie. Let's just type it short grass prairie. We know it's a proportion. SGP. Okay? All right. Occupancy, we specified. Finley Swift Fox. Here's our file. 814. Okay? Click all right. Okay, let's open up the PIM chart. There's our piece, and then size is our parameter of interest. So a uh, logical model to run right off the bat just to see what the data look like would be to make this constant. Three number, okay, run, close, run, current model, p dot, psi dot. So what do we got? We got P and we got Psi. So we got a 0.6 for P and we got a 0.73 for Psi. Uh, derived parameters, we got Psi hat. The reason why Psi gets dumped out as derived parameter, even though it's in the real parameters, is because we're going to run some of these other models that do not have Psi as a parameter, like the Royal Nichols. We're going to compute Psi. So I'll show you that in a minute. Let's do a bit more complex model for a minute first. Um, bring in that covariate of short grass prairie. So let's go back and, well, no, we can do it with just that design. Well, I shouldn't show you bad tricks like that. Let's, uh, let's go back and make this time varying again like it's supposed to be. A lot of times I run that dot dot model first thing because that way I check the data, make sure everything's right, the encounter history file's right. And I got a rough idea what things ought to look like. I mean, I now know that P is pretty high, and I also know that Psi is fairly high. So I kind of have an idea what I'm looking at. So now let's do a design matrix. What happens if I do full? Yeah, okay, there we go, good. Just like I like. If you hit design matrix full, you'll get the full design matrix with the intercept and then all the P's labeled, and then there's your Psi. Um, well, maybe we should run this first, P of T. So I click OK. This is going to be, now there are no groups, so get rid of the G. And it's just a psi. There's only one psi, psi dot yet. I click OK. And it likes it slightly better. You notice it didn't give us the right number of parameters. How come? Well, we got a bunch of them there at one, which tells me that I don't need all that time variation. Well, maybe I do need some time variation. <laughs> we'll leave it alone for the moment, but I'll just adjust the number of parameters. Number of parameters should be nine. Okay. Now, let's go back into that model and put in short grass prairie. So I click. Right click, add one column. Click, right click, individual covariates. I want short grass prairie. And we'll label it. Label I can even provide initial parameter values, just to show you that trick again, emphasize it. Because now, if, if I say I retrieve the results from the PT side dot model, 
all the variables are filled in except short grass prairie. So it's going to start off the optimization, optimization with that best T model we just had and add in short grass prairie. And again, it should have 10 parameters. But you can see what it did. It had a huge impact. Well, not a huge, but big. Let's plot it and look at it. So if I look at psi <coughs> as a function of short grass prairie, it varied between 0 and 1. Yeah, that looks good. And there it is. Legend position upper left. There we go. That's what you like to see. <laughs> nice tight confidence intervals. Covariate explains psi really well. The others, the month and stuff, that's all for, for P. You don't, I mean, we're not expecting occupancy to vary by month. What, well, it might actually, but, but that isn't what the, the purpose of those covariates is to, to model P. So I'll, I'll leave those for you guys to work with. Uh, obviously, foxes, let me tell you a little bit about swift fox biology so then you'll, you'll uh, understand what's going on here. They have their young in the spring. The major predator of swift fox is coyotes. And so a swift fox, a successful swift fox is never more than 100 yards away from a den that it can jump into and defend itself from a coyote. An unsuccessful swift fox is, becomes coyote poop. <laughs> so they, uh, they have to be pretty cagey. And so in the, when, they're, when they've got young, they've got a lot of dens scattered all around down through the, the country that they can get into. Uh, so month has a big deal with it because when they've got young, they've got to be out foraging a lot more and they're a lot more vulnerable. Uh, I don't know how much trapping he actually did when they have young. He did some, I know. Um, so anyway, month has a lot to do with their movements and their, build, their vulnerability to being trapped. So that's why month's such a big deal in there, the sine month and cosine month. And maybe even short grass prairie affects their trapping success. I don't know. You could try that too. So that's kind of what's going on with those variables. Okay, questions? All right. <clears throat> Let's, uh, you guys can work on that one. You can work on, the, there's another one by Martin on Swift Fox. There's also the Palm Springs one, and there's all the BBS stuff that you can play with too on that. Let's go back and do a file, new file. Let's do a robust design. All right, you open up robust design and you see three different models right at the top that you want to think about first, that we'll talk about. Psi and epsilon and gamma, you only need one of those parameters. I mean, you only need two of those parameters. In other words, you start off this model right here. You start off with psi 1. You got to have a psi for your first site because, or the first primary occasion, because there's no way to explain it other than just psi. But then from then on, the epsilons and the gamma, the colonization and extinction parameters, dictate what psi is going to become, right? It flips back and forth. So this model has a psi 1, and then it has a gamma and an epsilon for every succeeding occasion. So if you've got t primary occasions, it's going to be t minus 1 gammas and t minus 1 epsilons, but you still have to have a psi 1. Up here, we've got psi and epsilon. We don't have gamma in the model. In other words, we're going to get a psi for every occasion and an epsilon for all the intervals, but we won't get a gamma. It'll be a derived parameter. Vice versa here, we've got a psi and a gamma. Now, my advice is not to mess with those models, to go right to this one, and here's why. When you take that parameter out of the model, you can get some uh, weird results, uh, wonky results, as Evan would say. Um, You'll get a psi and epsilon, and then the gamma derived estimates will be like greater than one and all kinds of weird stuff. Daryl and I've talked, Daryl McKenzie and I've talked about that quite a bit. And basically, these originally were put in there so you could model psi as a function of covariates. But the more I think about it, the more I like this model better because it makes sense to me that the covariates 
uh, ought to be modeling gamma and epsilon and not psi. You ought to be trying to model the process, not the, not the result of the process. So anyway, I advocate basically using the psi 1, gamma, and epsilon. Down here are the same exact models, but with the mixture models on P, so that you can model some individual heterogeneity. So these three, oops, psi epsilon, psi gamma, psi 1, epsilon, gamma, and epsilon with heterogeneity. And I'll just jump ahead, but down here are the psi epsilon with random effects, psi gamma with random effects, psi 1, gamma, epsilon with random effects. Again, the one I would use mostly would be this one if I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in psi. In a P, sorry. Your random effects are on P. So you'll have a sigma P in that model. Up here you're going to have a pi and a set of mixtures on P for these guys. All right. Uh, these are multi-state. We don't want to do those right now. Multi-state conditional general. They, they get a little weird. And when you've got, in other words, that's your owl nest going along. You've got a single member that's there. You've got a pair, or you got a young. So you got like three states. And then let's see. Down here we've got the false positive model with psi one gamma epsilon the false positives. Here we've got the relaxed closure, and here we've got um, multi-scale. That's again, you've got a big unit like refuges or square miles, and then within that you've got smaller pieces, smaller subunits. So let's just start off with this guy, and let's go do the. Well, let's do those tiger salamanders. They were they were interesting looking. Let's go see where they were again. Forty-eight and thirty-one. Better write that down. Well, I can remember it that long. So we got. Oh, we got to know the total there. Seventy-nine. Okay. So we go back in here. Let's put that in there before I forget it. Seventy-nine. Don't need to do that. All right. What were they again? <laughs> 48 and 31. So I enter easy, robust design times. There's two, 48 and 31. OK? Everybody following what I just did? As I found her around here on Thursday morning. All right, so this is Tiger Salamanders. Actually, what I should do is just go grab this. There we go. Nice label. One attribute group, no covariates. Okay. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one. Okay. It's saying that. This file only contains 40 semicolons. In other words, there's only 40 encounter histories. I don't want to go there because I don't want to write the one I forgot and I was going to overwrite it. So I'm going to redo it here in just a second. But what that message was telling you was that the file seems kind of short given that you've only got 40 encounter histories and you've got a lot of parameters here. But it's because there's so many occasions that we really don't have that many parameters. So let me start over here since I screwed up and forgot to label or change my name anyway. Uh, robust design. Okay.
Now I won't forget to change my name this time. Okay, so there's that message again. It's saying, is this file proper market counter histories file? It's just sort of thinking, yeah, you know what you're doing here. This doesn't seem quite right. You've only got 40 occasions. And you've got, or 40 semicolons, but you've got like 79 occasions, and that just doesn't seem quite right. But it is. It's just a little check. So it created a new file. Gary, do you know what the study design was on that? What's that? Do you know what the study design was on that? Did they go out 40 some consecutive days then? Or was that when they went out and did lots of sampling on one day? Well, they just did different ones on different days, and they went for 79 days, I guess. I don't know why they did it that way. You know, if there's a day that you just don't. Let me look at the PIM. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a right-click constant, right-click constant. Remember the overlap. So now we've got a psi, we've got one epsilon, one gamma, because that's all there could possibly be. And then we've got a constant P and a constant P for first, first primary and second primary. Close, run. So I've got a psi 1. I got a epsilon. Actually, dot one doesn't make any difference. Gamma dot, and then I got p of primary, and I can put it back on a sign link. In this case, click OK, go five. So there you are. So they started off with a psi of 26%. 18% of those of those 26 went extinct. So, but of those 74 that were not extinct, or that were extinct, 14% of those became colonized. Okay? All right, there were 26% of the original plots that were, were occupied. Of those 26%, 18% of those went extinct. So whatever 26 times 0.18 is, that's how many you lost. You can figure it out. And then, but now of the 74% that were not occupied, in other words, one minus psi, 14% became occupied. So how many total were occupied at the end? <laughs> what was psi 2? You can figure it out. But it's a drive parameter. Let's go look at the drive parameters. There you are. There's your 20. So the answer is 32%. <laughs> yeah. So is it 18% of that 26? Yep. That one, I think, or 18% yep. of the entire? Nope. No, no, because they can't go extinct unless they're occupied. So let's go back and look at that number for just a second so again. So this graph says that, would that be 14% so of 74% is more 76. than It's more than 26. Yeah. So more colonized. Yeah, well, we, let's, let's work out the math and just show you here. Let's, all right, so this is another case. Let's go back in, output, specific model output, parameter estimates, Real estimates, copy real estimates of standard errors to Excel. Okay? So Excel is going to light up over here. It's off the edge of the screen. There it is. All right, let's open this up. Let's see. Let me get the view a little big. Well, uh, can I make the view just a little bigger? Zoom. Uh, zoom. 200%. That should do it. Ah, there you can see it. All right. All right. So let's just do it this. Uh, went extinct. That would be equal to this star this. And colonized. That would be 
equals paren 1 minus up here times here. So uh, psi 2 is going to be equal to this times 1 minus epsilon plus 1 minus psi star gamma. Right? Look at the formula again. But psi times the probability of not going extinct plus the ones that were extinct times the probability they were colonized. And that's 32. If we go back to Mark and look, we look at the, there it is. So I done good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this lambda prime, what lambda prime is, is what uh, the occupancy folks are now saying they want to use rather than lambda. Uh, the reason why lambda sort of fell out of favor is because you could literally have everything go extinct. Okay, so lambda is suddenly zero. Well, once lambda is zero, it never can come back. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, at first you think, oh, yeah, it's kind of cool. We're watching Psi go through time. And, you know, it's, it's going up and it's going down. And, and so, um, so when Psi is 1 and they stays 1, when Lambda is 1 and everything's fine, but then, you know, it can drop down and Lambda is jumping up and down. But then all of a sudden they all go extinct. Now, this is in your sample. But the whole sample goes extinct. They're all zero. Well, lambda can never come back. <laughs> so that's why they go to the, this lambda prime is a, uh, is a uh, log, a logic transformation of kind of a deal. I'd have to go look it up again. I forget exactly how it is defined. But anyway, um, <clears throat> that's kind of what they're using now. And now I'm sure there's going to be a big discussion in the, in the new edition of the book about lambda prime, because they pretty much got away from lambda. Larissa told me that I should take lambda out, or at least put in lambda prime. She didn't say take lambda out of Mark, but but definitely lambda prime is what they're using now to kind of look at what's going on. So, so yeah, it's the same deal, I believe. I believe when lambda prime is one, it's staying stable, and when it goes up, it's greater than one, and when it goes down, it's less than one. But it can never go negative or never go to zero like lambda did. Okay, so 